Intergenerational trauma is the only type of trauma that is handed down our family line. And that actually happens at the intersection of our biology and our psychology. I guess, because we're going to talk about a lot of really important things, a lot of things that I'm hoping the audience will take to heart and, and utilize in their own life. But I would love to start with who you are and why you are someone who can teach us about these topics. Yes. So I'm actually Dr. Mariel Bukem, a licensed psychologist, and I specifically work with the area of trauma. So any emotional injuries that we have experienced that have kind of kept us pretty stuck in a place where we have experienced ongoing sorrow, ongoing grief, and where we're trying to kind of get out of those spaces into a place of healing. So my area is generational healing or trauma healing. And I'm also an author of a book, Break the Cycle, A Guide to Healing Intergenerational Trauma. And I focus in the area of trauma in the book as well. So it's a comprehensive healing guide for anybody who wants to do the work of healing trauma. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a, like a 10,000 follow-up questions. I'm very excited. Um, and this is something that I've learned a lot about through my own family, through my own trauma, through my own therapy. But just to take it down to the most basic level, because I think there are a lot of experts now on social media who aren't credentialed, who aren't doctors, who maybe share ideas that aren't always accurate. Could you explain at the most basic level, what is trauma mm. and how does it affect us emotionally and physically and in all the ways? Why is this something the audience should really familiarize themselves with? Well, you know, in part, it's, it's important for us to familiarize ourselves because it is actually incredibly common to experience trauma in life. And so I want to almost kind of front load that before I even get into the definition for us. But trauma is the experience that we have of continuously being in survival mode, meaning we are continuously trying to protect ourselves after we have had an event that made us one, either fight for our lives or um, fight to be seen or fight to be heard or feeling like we were made to feel invisible or unworthy. So whenever we have those kinds of experiences in our lives, it is likely that we can get basically stuck in what we call like a fight, flight, freeze or fawn um, nervous system process, which means that Basically, our nervous system is continuously trying to protect us and is alerting us and sometimes over alerting us to the possibilities of dangers in our environment. So we might see our partner as somebody that's like our enemy because we're constantly trying to protect ourselves when in reality we are overestimating maybe something that they said in, in an effort to protect ourselves and in an effort to overprotect ourselves. So it's sort of like something happens to you. I mean, it could be happening today, but let's say something happens to us in our past, in our childhood, somewhere along the road, many things. I think all of us experience trauma many times in our lives. And then you find yourself today experiencing something that's almost like, oh God, I can't think of a better explanation, <laughs> like a hangover or like the ghost mm -hmm. of that moment in your life like you're sort of pulled back I always think of it as like I'm six years old again I'm 14 yeah. years old again like it's not Rachel at 40 who's kind of operating the ship right now it's a younger version of me who sort of pulled back into that moment is that right that's right like there isn't an identifiable threat in sight anymore but you are incessantly trying to protect yourself and that's when we can say okay that is what we call a trauma response where you're just kind of, one might say, just frozen in this idea that you have to be in a constant state of alert. Otherwise, if you let your guard down, something bad could happen. Yeah. This was um, huge for me when I started doing, I did therapy as a teenager. And when I went back into therapy as, a, as an adult and a young mother, this was a huge thing for me to understand. I would ask, I learned to ask myself, because I was experiencing really, really hard um, anxiety. I was having anxiety attacks and I wasn't um, able to really function very well. And I remember my husband at the time 
was like, what's wrong? And I, this was, gosh, 15 years ago. We didn't have social media giving us all these ideas or advice. And I don't feel like I knew what books to read or where to go. So I didn't know what was happening to me. And when he would say, what's wrong? I kept saying, I don't know, but something is. Like I couldn't, now obviously what you're saying, I'm like, well, that makes sense. But back then I just thought, well, I'm crazy or Mm -hmm. I don't know how to deal with life or I don't know how to handle this. And what I learned that was so helpful was I would think, okay, at what point in your day did this start to happen? Because I was getting, I realized later through my therapist, thank you, Deborah, Mm -hmm. um, I was getting triggered by something that was occurring, but I didn't know that language and I didn't know what was happening. So I would, the anxiety would build and build and build. And it wasn't until I could go back and identify, this sounds silly, but I remember a big one for me was like, I, a man had cut me off in traffic and then he like, I could tell in his car, he was just irate. He was like screaming in his hands. And I had the worst anxiety, like it just spiraled and snowballed. I ended up having a really bad anxiety attack. And I was like, wait, this morning I was great. I remember I went to Starbucks. I was feeling really good. Had a great meeting, like wind, oh, it was in the car and it was in traffic and it was that man and you're a doctor, so you probably could, you know, attach a very easy loop. My dad had a crazy temper. Mm -hmm. He was irate. He would punch holes in the wall. Like I I was back there again Mm -hmm. from a stranger in a car I interacted with for 30 seconds. So it doesn't even have to be your partner, your bestie. Like it can be these moments and you don't even realize why it's happening. Right. You know, we have two different ways in which we can actually get triggered. And one is through our senses. So it's through whatever you might see, smell, touch, taste, or hear. Oh, that's real. Smell, I bet, is a big one. Smell is actually one of the, well, one might say even the most uh, important one connected to memory and emotion Because smell is the only sense that actually has a direct route to the center of the brain that's actually connected to your nervous system and to emotion and emotion regulation. Wow. So does that just on the flip side, does that then mean it's also could be a powerful tool to help you calm back down? It sure can. I've never. Yeah, I've never thought about that. That's a really because there are certain I can even I bet listeners too can think of a smell or something that you've walked into that will bring you back. But then what a beautiful idea that you can sort of take control and go in the other direction and that you could pull in something that will help you to calm down. That's that's a big aha for me. I love that reframe. It's really beautiful. And I and that's the kind of reframe that I love to invite even into my work when I'm working with folks, because it offers us an opportunity to see anything that's related to trauma as perhaps approachable. And maybe not as daunting as we've seen it in the past. It's almost been that thing that you just can't touch, right? Yeah. But now, you know, I think that people are perhaps more willing to have a conversation about trauma factors, including triggers or anything else related to trauma, and then how we can actually start addressing these wounds. The other part of, you know, how we can get triggered is actually more internal, So it's not necessarily something in your environment that you might sense, you know, oh, that's different. And so it kind of catapults you back into whatever time. But it's an actual emotion or a feeling of or a state of being. Mm. So, for example, if you feel a sense of guilt about maybe not picking up your kid on time for school, that just the feeling of guilt, that guilt can actually remind you of a moment Back in time when you felt this deep guilt for whatever reason, maybe like your parents divorced and that meant that your mother could no longer afford certain things because you now lived in a single family, single mother household that, you know, was different in income status. Yeah. And the guilt that you felt on behalf of your mother was all consuming. And now you're right back into that guilt. Right. So guilt itself can be triggering as well or any emotion for that matter. It just made me think, too, that when I was learning to manage my anxiety, when I was learning to live with it, when I was learning tools that would help, this sounds so silly, but I 
could be triggered and have an anxiety attack because I had too much coffee. Like I would feel, because to me, having too much caffeine would start to feel like a lot of the same energy that I feel if I'm having anxiety, right? Like I feel a little twitchy and maybe I'm nervous in my stomach. And if I didn't slow down and catch myself, I'd have full blown anxiety because of espresso, not because anything was wrong. Because it was like my brain was going, what's, why are we feeling, why, what, something must be bad, something must be happening. So that's a really good one. I haven't ever looked at it through the lens of emotion, of certain emotions, like I can think of in my life feeling content or feeling happy or feeling safe and that actually triggering me and making me feel unsafe because it's like, well, the other shoe's going to drop, like mm-hmm. something's going to happen because it feels too good right now. And I'm sort of brought back. So that I'm hoping in this conversation today that listeners have moments of like, that's why I'm doing this thing. Mm -hmm. That's why going to this house. That's why, you know, when I've got to go back to my aunt's house for Christmas and that's going to make me feel like this, this and this. When we can understand why we're doing things, to me, it's one of the most powerful tools. I, I don't know if everyone does this, but I tend to be pretty hard on myself. So when I'm having moments where I don't feel like I'm in control of my emotions, I'm like, something's wrong with me, as opposed to like, oh, no, this happened. This very specific thing happened, and this is why, and here's how you can navigate out of it. Mm -hmm. I wish that more of us had actually been taught what you just said, that exact reframe of like really seeing our emotions and like mapping back like what's connected to it. I wish that we had some sort of a lesson like back in health ed, back in high school, that would have taught us that, that Mm -hmm. would have said, hey, you know, here are these emotions that you experience every day. This is how they can show up. This is what triggers are. And any other kind of piece of information that could have saved us a lot of grief as adults. Yeah. I mean, that's a good one, too, just thinking of our own children and anyone listening to this who has kids to think, okay, what are some of the things, and this is our question for you, is like, I don't know why I'm speaking as like three people. This is our question for you. (laughs) (laughs) Um, This is my question for you, is how could we better equip our children? Or what are some things that we could teach them that would just help them to hold awareness of trauma and triggers and how they show up in our lives? Oh, it's such a good question. I love um, that we could focus on kids because when it comes to trauma, we always focus on the adults that had childhood trauma, but forget that there are kids that are living a life right now today that could possibly be experiencing symptoms of trauma. So I appreciate the question a lot. And the important thing to consider, first and foremost, is that kids need a place of safety. They need a person of safety, they need an area of safety. So primarily, you know, it it would be like a place that's connected to their home or in their home. And if we could actually establish or create places of safety or be a safe person for the children in our lives, I think that that could already be one of the most important pieces of like creating an emotional foundation that can be more sturdy and can even help buffer any trauma that they may have undergone already. But beyond that, one of the most important things to consider when it comes to trauma for both adults and children is body awareness. It's body sensations. It's body mapping. It's having an understanding of, oh, my head hurts. It's probably because, like, I'm thinking about that horrible thing that happened and, you know, I'm thinking about it a lot and now my head is feeling it, right? Uh, just to use kind of more child-centered language, right? Um, Or my belly hurts. Oh, you know, there's no actual, as a parent, one might say, no actual identifying factor or reason why there may be a belly ache. But today was a pretty difficult day at school. Maybe it was an anniversary of the loss, you know, that they experienced of a grandparent or something, right? And so now they're connecting, you know, to that loss and feeling a little bit of tenderness in their gut. Right. And so like when we can actually help a child to then not only pay attention to what their body is telling them, but also to 
maybe start growing in their awareness that sometimes emotions look like body sensations. Maybe they look like a headache or maybe they look like a bellyache, right? And so like that's going to be really critical because what we know about trauma is that is it, a lot of it is situated in our bodies. Our bodies are a living, breathing representation of the things that happen to us. Yes. The body keeps the score. It Everyone sure does. should read the book. <laughs> it sure does. And it's, you know, now we have such an, a, a burgeoning and beautiful body of evidence around this that cannot be contested, right? Like we see it from multiple angles that the body is literally keeping the score. So why not help the little ones to understand that in, in the ways that they can internalize it? I have um, two things as you were speaking that this reminded me of in my own parenting career is my six-year-old daughter for as long as she's been able to use words, will tell you every day, all day long, the most recent way that she hurt herself. So she scratched her knee, she got a paper cut, she always wants a Band-Aid, at least once a day. She's six years old, we've gone through a lot of Band-Aids. And at first I just thought, you know, she's my only girl, so I'm like, maybe this is a girl thing, I don't know, the boys didn't do this, but she kept doing it, and finally I realized Noah, do you need a hug? Oh. Do you want a hug? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, baby, you don't ever have to have a problem to get a hug. Mom's always here. We're, uh, you know, brothers are here. Oh. Like everyone, we'll, we're here to hug you. You don't have. So trying to teach her that, because she had learned at some point, you know what you do with mm -hmm. like a toddler. They yes. heard, oh, and you get it. Yes. And so she had learned that if she just wanted some, she wanted that emotional touch point that she needed to have a scratch. And by the way, half the time there was nothing there, but I would just give her a Band-Aid because I don't, who cares, like a sticker, just you know, <laughs> put it on. So I thought of that. And then I also thought of my son who, there's a really specific trigger, and I feel like he'd be comfortable with me talking about it, that was a great conversation for us to have, that um, his dad passed away earlier this year, their dad passed away. And when I had, and I'm even saying it right now, it's making like my chest hurt because mm -hmm. it was such a hard moment. Mm -hmm. But when I had to tell them that their dad had passed away, I went into the story's room and I said, hey, buddy, can I talk to you? You know, can you come into the living room? I need to talk to you. And obviously then, you know, afterwards they heard just the hardest thing mm -hmm. ever. And we had the hardest conversation as a family. And he then really started to struggle anytime I walked in his room. So mm -hmm. he would, and at first, like, I couldn't really, I wasn't cluing into what was happening. He couldn't verbalize that yet, but he would, he was just, oh, mom, I, like, I'd just be like, hey, buddy, do you know where the dinner's ready or, you know, just anything. And he would, you know, like, feel all, and then not really be able to explain what he was feeling or understand why. And so we sat down, he's like, something's wrong, and I, we sat down, we talked, what is, is it, am I doing something? Am I telling, you know, I was trying to, am I, have I, and he's like, it's you walking in my room. Mm -hmm. Whenever you walk into my room, even if nothing's wrong, when I see you in the doorway, I think you're about to tell me something bad. And so it sounds so silly, but then for months, I would like, I'm, I'm walking towards your door. Oh, I am walking, and then we both laugh, and they could, but just that way he knew that nothing bad was going to happen when I walked in. But I just want to say that for any other parents who are listening, that it did take us a few conversations. He couldn't articulate what was wrong. He just knew that there was something and we had to kind of unpack it and figure it out together so that we could come up with a solution. And it didn't honestly have to be a heavy you know, hard, oh, okay, we don't, it was just like, hey, mom, can you shout at me? Like, can you let me know in advance so I don't get scared if I see you walk in the room? Mm, wow. Well, yeah, that that's so powerful. And it's such a, a beautiful way to also relay how a family can be curious about each other in in moments when triggers happen and how that curiosity can lead you down a path of creating a solution that can work for both parties. And I think that that's just so beautifully elaborated in, in, in that moment. Um, and, and I can't imagine, you know, how hard it must have been to 
hold on to the grief that you were both experiencing while trying to find solutions so that you can get through this season of your life together in a way that, you know, felt like love was at the center and you were, you know, kind of in it together, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I think that one for for me, I was really conscious of I when I was fourteen, my older brother committed suicide, and it was is the most traumatic thing that's ever happened in my life, and I had a lot of PTSD mm-hmm. from that experience, and because I was fourteen and I found him, mm-hmm. there was so much. I had so many so much trauma around if I walked into a room and someone was sleeping, if I just anything that sort of reminded me of that moment. And there were a lot of things that didn't really make sense to my family and that, you know, every family has, everyone's on their own journey, but I don't know that my parents could have understood enough about maybe how our minds work or, or the right way to navigate that to understand. And so there were a lot of things that scared me afterwards that my parents would sort of be like, you're fine. Like mm-hmm. there's not. And I remember feeling like something's wrong with me because these things scare me. And I didn't ever want that to be the case with them. Mm-hmm. So when he was like, I am positive that if I had said to my parents, when you walk in my room, it makes me feel anxious. My parents would have been like, get over it, you're fine. Mm. So I was like, oh, I get it. I get having a response to something that maybe other people don't understand and I don't care what you need me to do. Like I'll wear a clown costume, I'll you know, drive a unicycle, like whatever is gonna make this feel a bit more okay for you because I think God, that's what, even as an adult, that's what I want. You know, that's what I want for my partner. That's what I want for my friends is to go, hey, I don't maybe understand why this stresses you out or makes you anxious, but like, I love you. And so I want to do what's going to make it a bit easier for you to navigate. You know, it, I, what you're explaining to us through your own story is a part of what happens when parents are cycle breakers, where you kind of figure out almost kind of like the, the new rule book all on your own, just based on intuition, just knowing that you want to approach situations differently because you remember how you felt when older generations had approached it through the lens that they held about, you know, how to engage in situations yeah. like that. And so that that tends to be kind of like the way that especially us like Gen X millennials tend to, you know, approach the parenting process where we're like, you know what, mm, that felt like the norm back then, but it didn't feel good. And I really don't want my child to then be the adult like me that had to be in search of their emotions or figure out why they were feeling, you know, X, Y, and Z. I want them to be more attuned to their emotions, be more grounded, feel more connected, feel like I am a presence in their lives that they can always rely on, like all the things, right? And so usually cycle breaker parenting tends to be, you know, the the type of parenting that just kind of goes off intuition and then like figures it out. But usually parents tend to create like a different kind of like home atmosphere than what they saw growing up. Man, it's so good. And it's honestly, when I saw your book, I mean, we've already talked about so many things that I love and didn't think we were going to get to touch on. But when I saw your book coming out, the reason I wanted to sit with you was specifically to talk about generational trauma, because I do think that it's something that it's affecting. I mean, you're obviously are going to go into so much more detail, but it's affecting so many people, maybe affecting everybody. And it almost, it's for sure something I can imagine it being like the eighties or the nineties and my parents hearing someone talk about that and them thinking, that's crazy. That's ridiculous. There's no way that something that happened to grandpa is affecting a grandkid. And it totally is. So for people who have never heard the term before, could you explain to us generational trauma and how it shows up in our life? Yes. So intergenerational trauma is the only type of trauma that is handed down our family line. And that actually happens at the intersection of our biology and our psychology. 
And what that means is that biologically, we have genetic markers that we basically inherit from our parents, grandparents, right? Like it, it kind of just flows down the family line that are reflective of their emotional experiences. What that means is that if they were, let's say, like chronically stressed or in trauma themselves, their genetic code would have been in a way kind of altered. So they would have actually had bodies that would have registered, hey, trauma's kind of the norm. That's just the status quo around here. And so when they conceived you, they would have conceived you by also giving you some of those genetic markers so right. that it's so i mean people need to listen to this because the psychology is something that i think maybe we understand a bit more but the biology yeah existing is i mean there's there's studies right about like um i i feel like this was a reference in the book that like um the uh, holocaust survivors that their children or their grandchildren There was something like they had, will you remind Mm -hmm. us? Yeah. So descendants of Holocaust survivors had actually lower cortisol levels than individuals who were Jewish identified who were not directly descended from Holocaust survivors. And what does that mean, lower cortisol? So cortisol is actually a stress hormone. So cortisol is actually connected to a lot of things, but it is the primary stress hormone. And what we know about low cortisol levels is that low cortisol levels is typically highly correlated with PTSD. So what that, in short, would have been telling us is that the individuals that descended from Jewish Holocaust survivors would have inherited at least some emotional vulnerability that would have eventually in their adult life translated into PTSD. And so there is a a trauma factor there, like people that survived a deep, terrorizing trauma would have more, more than likely, especially given the longstanding you know, nature of the Holocaust and the, the terrors of it, would have had some sort of change in their biological makeup. And that change would have then transferred onto their descendants, their children. Wow. And if you have lower cortisol levels, how would that affect your ability to handle stress when it shows up in your life? Well, what we know about the element of trauma in the body is that it, it it's multifold, right? So there are these, these cortisol elements and cortisol can actually be seen as both too high or too low, right? Like there's a lot of complexity there and nuance, but there's also, you know, the genetic element. And then there's also our nervous system, which I think our nervous system in particular is one area of our biological inheritance that is perhaps a little bit more accessible in terms of like what can we do about this? Um, and our nervous system also is an area that is, is in essence, like almost kind of like frozen in fear. Mm. And so we have these three aspects of our biological, you know, uh, experience or makeup or um, constellation that makes us, in essence, what we call kind of like tender, right? So predisposed to maybe experiencing stress, maybe at a higher level than your neighbor. And, and so that's the, the differential, right? But then the psychology kicks yeah. in. <laughs> yeah, I was like, just wait. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then we're born. And let's say that we have a mom who is deep in her trauma. Maybe she just, you know, got it out of a really turbulent relationship. It was incredibly toxic, left her with a lot of emotional markers of like trauma that means that you know her now six month old baby that relies on her to you know it stare at her and say you're so precious and you know goo goo gaga and yeah. like you need to be fed okay I'm attentive I'm present I'm mindful now this mom because she is constantly dissociating or not able to be present might miss a couple of the cues that the baby needs to to feel safe, to feel attended to, to feel cared for. And it's not necessarily something to say like, you know, let's blame moms or caregivers. It's just to say there is a slight chance that a type of trauma that you might have experienced could actually be taking away your attention, your capacity to be attuned at really critical points of a baby's infancy. Absolutely. 
And so, and that's why, like, you know, postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, like these things are, are so important for us to also address in the mental health field because it's such critical moments in mom and baby's lives where, you know, attunement is so, so important. Yeah. But then, you know, then the rest of life hits, right? Like maybe a kid goes into daycare and they get bullied, right? You know, and maybe they go into the school system and they can't really keep up with grades and that's pretty hindering to their self-esteem and maybe their first relationship is kind of bad and they go into a job and lose their first job and now they're in a financial crisis and so like life just hits they they suffer a pandemic right life hits and so all of those emotional vulnerabilities could then coincide with those other factors those other things that are happening and that's when we can say okay now this person has their own trauma symptoms their parent had trauma symptoms and now they have trauma symptoms, which means that the trauma is intergenerational. Yeah. God. I, I mean, I can see this in so many different ways and it's so, I'm hoping that people are like making connections right now as you're telling these stories, because I feel like we all have our version of this, but even the idea that like as a new mom, you're sort of missing things because you don't have the capacity in those moments to take care of the baby the way that you would hope that we would all be able to take care of a baby. But then it also, as an adult daughter, makes me, like the more that I learn about trauma and the more work I do on myself, the more compassion I have for my parents. I think I went through kind of my 20s and 30s feeling pretty... Um, maybe bitter about their choices and how they parented and, you know, sort of wishing that it was something else. And the more that I learn about it and the more I'm like, they did not have information. They did not have therapists. They did not have anybody who was speaking this into their lives. So imagining both my parents had very significant trauma as children and then tried to be parents themselves. I have so much more compassion for like, yeah, of course. That was the best. You you kept us alive. I do. I mean, I know that sounds silly, but that has been a big um, flip for me to think about. I'm like, it's a miracle you all are not drug addicts. And like, you know, it's a miracle mm -hmm. that you kept a job, that you paid the bills, that you did the best you could. No, you didn't know how to do some of those emotional things or make always the right choices but like it really has helped me to have so much more compassion and then if you start looking generationally you're like yeah that's what happened to mama and that's what happened to her mama mm -hmm. and that and it just keeps going further and further back that you're like we I mean man we didn't stand a chance like you had there was no hope yeah. I think of I I I probably look too often at like, oh, this is everybody's life when it's not. But in my, my family, there was so much, oh my gosh, on both sides from my parents, so much trauma in, in all of the families. Um, and if you go back another, it, it just sort of keeps happening. And I think one of the kind of fabrics that is woven into our family is there's always a crisis. Mm. There's always something wrong. The world is always burning down. The world's out to get us. God's mad. Like there's just so much of that stuff that I sort of show up in this family as this like as far back as I can remember this little optimistic creature, Pollyanna, like it's going to be better <laughs> tomorrow. And I, I'm just, as you're talking about the psychology that's passed down, that was our family psychology yeah. was that life is hard at any moment it can all be taken away from you at any moment like you know life's not fair was my dad's favorite thing to say there was just so much like psychology that they pushed into us as kids that I think absolutely can't set you up for you know good shot as an adult but then each family must have their version of that Absolutely. Whether it's just like, oh, we're afraid of this segment of the population or, oh, um, you know, we don't talk to this member of the family. We all all of our families have a story that we're telling. Mm -hmm. And if you're what I'm hearing, like if the story that your family's been telling psychologically 
is one that's bound in trauma, you're going to you're going to absorb that whether you want to or not because you're a little kid and you have no choice. Yes, absolutely. You know, because kids are sponges and so they're just going to, you know, soak up what's in their environment. But what makes that really tricky is the fact that very often traumas in our families have occurred for such a long period of time or they've been a part of our communities for so long and they've just been like there's been like this wider contagion effect of like traumas that have never been addressed that basically it's passed on as the norm and people don't even know that they're actually like making or creating or generating the next generation of people that will be in their own traumas yeah how do we start to break those cycles? I mean, we talked earlier about cycle breaking, but let's say someone's listening to this right now and they're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> uh, we have this, like we got this. How, what do they do? Well, you know, the first step is already done if they're there, right? Because it, the first step is really acknowledgement. A lot of the reason why trauma doesn't ever get addressed is because people aren't willing to say that's trauma or we suffered and it falls under that category and we got to do something about it. Like what you aren't able to see isn't going to get healed because you're you're just casting it to the shadows of the family closet. So when you actually bring it out and say, actually, look, I'm going to put this here on the table, right front and center for everyone to see. This is trauma. We have to heal this. We need to all put in some something so that we can be better as a unit. That's the first step. And that's the most critical step because that's actually going to kind of like take everyone's just going to stop covering their eyes and like pretending like they don't see what's really in front of them. And people are going to be willing to approach the issue. Well, so I have two questions about mm-hmm. that. One, as an adult child, I think of um, my parents spanked us uh, like always. They spanked us with belts. They spanked us with spoons. They did things that I would say if I'm talking about my own kids, that that would be abusive. The things that happened to us, it was very common. In the 80s, it was very common in my culture, like Southern, church-minded, like spare the rod, spoil the child, like all of this stuff was deeply ingrained in our culture. Added into the mix of like screaming, um, never physical with us, but like, very like breaking windows, punching holes in the wall, all of this stuff. I'm never going to get into that conversation with my family, with my parents, because I know the what the response would be, which is like, you're soft, you're a snowflake, people today can't handle mm-hmm. it, this is what we did. So if you're listening to this and you're like, yeah, if I'm being honest, if I look at my childhood through the lens of the adult – it wasn't okay. It was trauma, but I don't have a family that's maybe healthy enough to look and heal that trauma with me. Is that a journey we go on by ourselves? Do you talk to your siblings about it? Like, how do you try and hold the truth if there are parts of your family or people in your family who won't acknowledge that truth as well? Yeah, we actually have to grieve the part of us that still desires for them to say the words, I hurt you, I'm sorry. We have to be willing to almost kind of like sit in a funeral in our minds of the people that we had hoped that they could be, the ones that could step up and say, I caused you an enormous amount of pain and trauma. Um, And we have to step into the reality of like who we truly have in front of us, which is what I call our true family. Um, And our true family is the people with all the wounds and all the capacities to hurt and, you know, just all of their barriers to being able to actually approach the healing work. That's the true family that's in front of us most times. And that healing process of Engaging in a grief journey is actually really helpful in helping us to really transition from the hold that that fantasy has on us of like, we're going to have that parent that's going to step up and say, I'm deeply sorry. And there's also something that I think, you know, can help us kind of like maybe like um, along the, the road towards like compassion kind of leaning in the direction of what you were talking about earlier, like, you know, 
some of them just like we don't even know how they made it through. Yeah. Sometimes they have coping mechanisms that come out in their language and it feels really harsh, but that is the only way that they can protect themselves from feeling the immense hurt that's there and from all of it just bubbling to the surface when they don't actually have alternate ways to actually deal with that hurt. So when we don't have another coping mechanism that we can lean on, we're going to go into what's familiar, like pointing the finger or berating or all the things, because otherwise we would actually get tossed into the black hole of our darkness. And that is intolerable for most of us. So what we see on the surface is the parent that says, you're such a softie, but in reality, that's just a parent that doesn't want to go into themselves because that feels entirely too scary. Man. It makes me wonder, too. I've actually thought about this a lot that, you know, in 2024, when we're having this conversation, we're so much more conscious in choosing to have children. Like, not everybody, but like, I feel like there is the ability I don't it's kind of a funny way to say I grew up in a culture that was like that's what you do you're going to get married and you're going to have kids there is no question but now I feel like when I look at younger women today younger men today like that they are being more conscious about choosing whether or not that's the right choice for them but I think if I go back even generations before me that is not something that existed Mm -hmm. my parents Uh, this is maybe a crazy thing to say. I don't know that either one of them really should have had kids. And I'm not even sure either one of them wanted kids. I just think that that's what you did. And it wouldn't even have been a question to them about like, should I do this? Because that's just the next step in your life. So I'm really curious how that affected us generationally because you essentially I think of it as like you had these like wounded children who had wounded children who had wounded children and hopefully now we're getting information and learning and healing ourselves a bit more but that is really when I look at my parents I'm like you 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 I think my mom had I want to say she got pregnant when she was 18 and she was I mean like you didn't they didn't have a chance yeah and it that goes back if you go back, my grandmother was very close to my paternal grandmother got married when she was 13 years old, Mm. 13. Wow. What, what are we talking about? My dad told me that recently. And I was like, no, you mean she met grandpa when she, and he was like, no, no, that was, it was really common. You know, I'm like, what? Mm. No, that's so stressful. So I do think, I don't know. I'm learning to hold space for both of those. I'm learning to hold space as the 40 year old that can really look at them with so much love and compassion and go, my God, you didn't have a chance. And I also hold space for the little girl who's still very hurt by the things that happened and can remember moments. Like I, I remember recently I was telling my boyfriend about something that happened when I was little. And I don't know if you've gone through this or listeners will know some where you're like, if you've ever told a friend or a partner a story about childhood trauma and I was just telling it to him like oh and then oh that throat chakra just like (laughs) choked me Mm. um my uh, I was getting a spanking if you'd done something really bad you wouldn't they wouldn't react in the moment they'd make you go lay over the side of my bed Mm. (sighs) Mm. so I'd be in like the kitchen or something, you did something really wrong. So you had to like walk down the hallway and then go lay over the side of the bed and then they get a belt. Mm. And, oh my God, I've never said this publicly. And um, yeah, I was little, so I would, would when they would spank me, I would like try and cover my butt. Yeah. And they'd say, if you put your hands there, I'm going to keep spanking you until you move them. So you'd spank my hand, then you move your hands and then... And I, I'm such a goody two shoes. I can't even imagine what I had done mm. that earned that. And I was telling my boyfriend the story and I was telling him about this moment and I was just sort of talking the way I am to you. And I looked up and he was, he had tears in his, and he like couldn't 
understand what I was saying to him. Yeah. He was like, Rachel, what are you talking? What are because that's not something that happened in his family. And I'm just sharing the story because I assume everybody had parents who did that. And the premeditation of like, go into my room, I'm gonna like dramatically pull a belt out, like what on earth? Yeah. So I'm hoping that people are listening and maybe hearing some things that they can go, well, yeah, that, that would maybe track for why these moments in my adult life make me feel the things that I'm feeling or make me not feel safe when I go home for the holidays or make me um, do things to cope or do things to protect myself. Um, I'm just hoping that people are like making those connections today. Mm -hmm. And if they are, maybe understanding why we make some of the choices that we make. You know, why do you drink too much wine when you go home for Thanksgiving? Why do you not feel safe when you're around certain family members and then maybe make choices you wish that you hadn't? Mm -hmm. More than anything, like, it's not your fault. But now that you have this information, what are you going to do with it? Yes. That's, um, I, I can appreciate you sharing that. I feel like it's, you know, a circumstance that sounds so painful to just hear it. I can only imagine what it's like to reflect on it, you know? So, um, I want to see how you're doing. <laughs> you want to see how I'm doing? Yes. I, I just, I'm curious to know, like, how, how are you taking in, like, even telling that part of your story? Um, I feel... I definitely feel emotional, like I can feel tears behind my eyes. And I feel um, maybe a bit scared to tell that because uh, the response a lot in my family is I don't remember that. Well, there's this thing called traumatic invalidation where, you know, basically our inability to feel like what has happened can be validated or like our experiences can't be validated by the people primarily who are our caregivers, feels re-traumatizing on top of the trauma itself, um, which is why a lot of people just avoid it, just avoid the confrontation, avoid even the conversation, because it just feels like I'm just going to go right back into the wound and come out with a wound that had already had scar tissue on it, and now it's like a gaping wound that's yes. all reopened. It's so hard, you know. Um, but again, like I feel like, you know, sometimes their coping mechanisms could be hard for us and could be re-traumatizing to us because then we're like, you know, like I just want you to say it happened. That's step one. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and we, we likely won't get that because of their inability to cope with their own shame. Yeah. Boundaries are a big conversation on the show and a question that I get a lot from the audience is if someone identifies that there are people in their family who do trigger them or experiences or going to a certain house or going to be around certain people are it's just so anxiety filling for you but trying to put a boundary in place is really hard because other family members guilt you about it mm -hmm. how do you how do you navigate that well, the navigation is is going to require for for you to actually like have a couple things in place. So, number 1 is to have a cope ahead plan in place, which means that That's good. Yeah, you just have to have brainstormed some sort of an idea of what you're going to do before, during, and after any kind of trigger showing up. So that That's means so that <laughs> I'm, I'm stealing this. Okay, cope ahead. I yeah. love this. Okay. So beforehand, you want to prep yourself, meaning like you want to take like real deep breaths, not like, okay, I took a deep breath at the door, but like perhaps in the car, maybe for five minutes, like really allowing your body to really settle, right? Like you want to go in there with as settled of a nervous system as you possibly can. That's good. So then whatever hits you, hits you, but you're still grounded. So that's one, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm realizing for the first time the importance of that because I would walk into situations already in a heightened state. Yes. That's so good. Of course you would because yeah. you're already entering the environment that has all of the elements that you know are likely to trigger you. 
Your nervous system captures that through your senses well before you even consciously capture it. So you're already on alert prior to. So it's going to be really critical to do that first step. Then the, I'm going to jump to the third step, which is actually doing some sort of self-care after. Because what tends to happen is that we can't have, let's say, a big blow up and people just kind of go home and maybe sleep it off and don't realize, hey, your nervous system actually just went through something. It needs you to take a pause and say, OK, I'm going to take care of you now. I'm going to take a warm bath. I'm going to drink, you know, a lavender milk. I'm going to, you know, whatever it is that can actually help you to just settle yourself. Do the deep breathing again if that's accessible, whatever it is. But there's going to be somewhat of, for lack of a better term, emotional hangover, like a remnant, like a, you know, a, a, your, your emotions are actually because they are emotions that are being triggered from the past. They're going to keep lingering on even after you've left the house. So it's going to be really critical to also have a bit of a, okay, let me breathe now moment. I always think this when you go back into a family, if you if you have siblings, that you sort of regress yes. to what you guys acted like when you were younger. Yes. And you're like all of a sudden the middle child again or the baby again. It's just all the same crap. But the idea of preparing before, during, and at, like having a plan mm-hmm. is so good. Probably just like drinking wine is not a good thing. <laughs> but that's what most of us do. You're like, yeah. okay, let me just mute the feelings that I'm having or make this a little bit easier. And it's sort of like you're sabotaging the future version of yourself to be able to like navigate this particular moment. Mm-hmm. But oh, that's such a good tactic mm-hmm. for all of us to think through. Also, like the wine drinking lowers your inhibition and it could make you say something that is not actually coming from your wisest self, which is what eventually two days from now is actually going to instill pride in you. Oh, you know what? I actually said something that coincided with my values. It reflected my more healed self and it was a, a testament to the fact that my wiser self showed up in that moment. None of that is likely to happen if you have that alcohol in your system that's kind of like just lowering your inhibitions. And what's happening is that the the most wounded parts of you are going to be what's coming out and what actually is speaking on your behalf. So it's actually literally the opposite. Wow, that's so good. I was curious, too, as you were talking about like having a plan for navigating these times, I was thinking about what? How, I know this is like a kind of a hard right turn, but it connects in my mind that like we're walking into families that we didn't choose. And so we're trying to learn how to exist in that space as who we are now based on something that was built in the past that we didn't really have control over. But I feel like there are a lot of listeners of the show who are parents or maybe they're in a relationship that they found their partner that they're going to build something with, even if they don't decide to have kids. And they're navigating an environment where they're trying to build a good version of something they never saw. You know, maybe they do come from a lot of trauma and they're like, I want to break cycles. I want to do something different. I want to have something that I haven't seen how do you build a healthy relationship if you've never seen one modeled? How do you have, you know, great conversations with your kids if you never experienced that as a child? Like, how do we build something that we've never seen built before? The interesting part of what you're asking is the fact that most cycle breakers are doing that work out of sheer intuition. Like, there is something about a cycle breaker that's incredible, like super remarkable. And even, you know, my sister, she has a 16 year old boy. And when he was maybe like two years old, I would ask her like, what are you doing? Because it was so different than how we were raised. And I would almost kind of feel a a bit of, um, I don't know, like tension or like sometimes just, I would feel irritated with her, like just yell at that kid. You know, just like he's not doing what you're telling him to do. He's not listening. We came from yelling. You yell. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And she refused to do that. And right now I have a nephew who has this incredible emotional intelligence, this very somber way of, of, 
of him, just like this, this temperament that's gentle. And I think a lot of that is a reflection of how she, out of her sheer intuition, just knew, I just know it has to be different. I just know that I cannot yell, that I have to do kind of like the opposite mm. of what I saw growing up. And that's what cycle breakers tend to do. They do the opposite. They do things differently. And they go off intuition. And typically that lands their children at a different place than, you know, kind of where they landed when they were adults and when they were children. However, you know, it, it can be helpful to have a roadmap. It can help to have some sort of an idea of, okay, like, how do I do things in a way that actually very concretely can tell me, okay, this is the cycle breaking journey. And very often it's in the things that perhaps we just didn't see growing up that we just have to more concretely call out, like apologizing to children. That's yes. really essential. And it's something that some of us, we kind of miss. In generations past, they would just, you know, let us sit with whatever it is that they did to us and then they would feed us. And, you know, then the next day it's time for school and everyone so-called forgot about everything yep. that happened, yep. right? Yeah, and that's, the reality of that is that that's not forgotten. Yeah. Our bodies remember, our minds remember, our hearts remember. Yeah. And it's really unfair to leave a child in a place where they have to make sense of why the person that is supposed to love them the most is also showing them what it feels like to be terrorized. Oof. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's really good. The apology thing is so real. I read um, the book you wish your parents had read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, which is so fantastic. And there's a whole chapter in there about apology and how so many of us never saw that modeled and how important it is that we, at least for me, I think like I just want that to be a very normal thing. I want I hope for my children that they just take ownership of, hey, I screwed up. I'm going to try and do better. Like, let's talk it through. So I model that a lot. Like, hey, buddy, I lost my temper with you. Or, hey, I'm sorry I jumped to conclusions and I thought you meant this and you didn't. And um, especially with my teenagers, that's a big one. Is like I want them to see it because I'm hoping that they grow up to be adults who then do the same thing. Mm -hmm. How... Uh, you know, and maybe I'm I'm going off on a tangent that you're like, this is not my area of expertise. But I am curious how, as parents, if we see certain areas where uh, I'm like really thinking of my own, um, I always say my parenting career, like my life as a parent, that I, and I've said this publicly many times, like, Younger children are not my favorite. Uh, I'm not, you know, my, I am not one of those moms that like love a toddler and like I want, I love teenagers. I love, the older they get and the more conversation they can have, the like the funner it is for me. But I do, especially with my daughter, because I have, I have one girl, she's my youngest. And I do think like, oh man, I really, I need to like, get down on the floor and play with her more. We play, but we're definitely playing on a level that like I would prefer. Let's play a board game. Let's play a, and I just feel like if she would just die, if I was like, let's sit in the floor and play with your dolls or mm -hmm. let's do these things. I just have this intuition that that's what she would really love mm -hmm. and appreciate. It is not something I ever got. Not one time. Mm -hmm. I never experienced that as a child. So I have this sort of tension and I, I feel this a lot of like, I heard someone say the things that you get most angry with your kids about are the things you were never allowed to freely express when you were little. Yes. And I feel that so much. Mm -hmm. I catch myself doing it all the time is, you know, they'll do something that's like, she's such a wild child and like a, she just is her own little creature and I'll, you know, like brush your hair and like put on a cute outfit and all of these things that I'm like, Oh my God, my upbringing is falling out of my mouth. Mm. And so I have this, and I'm looking for advice if you've got it on, I really want to lean in that direction of this intuition of this thing. But like, honestly, it just sounds 
so boring. I just, I'm like, I never did this as a kid. I really don't. I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So am I, is it like, shut up and just do the thing because you know that your kid would love this thing and it would create this moment? Or is that also kind of disingenuous because it's not truthful? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm sure that there is something out there that has not been found that will tie the two of you in, in a way, in a bond where you would both be in your utmost enjoyment. You're right. That feels right what you just said. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, there is an opportunity for there to be so much authenticity, so much authentic joy pouring out of both of you. Um, I'm sure that that's out there. And in addition to that, you're reminding me of uh, this concept that I, you know, I talk about in, in the book, but I also like talk about it in my work, which is intergenerational parenting, where sometimes we have these, we'll call them blocks, right, toward doing something with the next generation, with our kids, with the, the little humans, because we ourselves are still working on the wound that is still there for us. And so when we're talking about reparenting from an intergenerational perspective, we're always talking about parenting back, meaning parenting ourselves or reparenting ourselves and parenting forward, which means, you know, doing the things that we understand will build a happy childhood for our children. But the parenting back is a really critical aspect that a lot of parents, because they're, they're just thinking about making things better for their kids they're forgetting that they themselves still need a little bit of attention and nurturance and care and that that nurturance and care would then translate into them being an even better parent because yes. they're going to be more attuned, more present, more patient even, right? And so all those things will start coming out in greater potency because of the reparenting that they're doing for themselves. It's so good. I'm curious too, thinking about generational trauma and how that manifests what does this look like I have a hunch but what does this look like in like for instance how we take care of our bodies so I think of an um, example in my own family if we stretch all the way back my family comes over from Ireland they're immigrants in this country we are we really struggle financially for many many generations um, my grandparents, who I mentioned earlier, I was very close with migrant farm workers struggle financially. My family struggles financially, but does better than the generation before it. I've done better than my parents have financially, but I can look at particularly the, my paternal lineage all the way back. And there is so much, um, there's a lot of fear around food and scarcity mm -hmm. and a lot of obesity in my family mm -hmm. and a lot of um, particularly like kind of hoarding food and storing food and we're not going to have enough and we're going to run out. And if you get a chance to go out to a restaurant, if you get a chance to eat, you're going to eat everything. You're going to mm -hmm. like my dad, his sisters, my grandparents, I, mean, I like I, we had a huge extended family, so I could see it at every gathering. There was so much like fear around not eating. And it really showed up in people's health. Mm -hmm. And not only was there fear around not eating, but then they also, they were eating very specific foods, which was a lot of the food that you could get and had access to, beans and potatoes and things that going back for a long time was sort of our family's food. I'm just curious how this works out or what you might have seen in research for like different cultures or different, like how this shows up in our bodies, our food choices, um, even the way that we maybe carry weight on our body or sort of make choices out of fear or like a scarcity mindset that is psychologically connected to past generations. Mm hmm you know, the field of epigenetics is actually a field that has actually helped us to understand both the, one might say, like, physical health component of um, how we carry the stories in our families and then also the emotional health component. We have a lot, and perhaps 
10 times more of an understanding of how our families, either behaviors, meaning like what they have chosen to do or what has happened to them, like a famine, like genocide, like, you know, um, poverty, mm -hmm. like, you know, all these things that are, are things that can happen to either a collective of people or a smaller sector um, of society and how they can be impacted by all of those things um, in, in a way that actually genetically can change the ways in which their bodies metabolize sugar or the ways in which their bodies perhaps may be hyper-inflamed. I swear on my life, I'd like two weeks ago just had this conversation with my boyfriend. I'm like, this must be a thing. There must be a thing to how certain foods affect certain cultures because of how those foods were used or even what we had to do or how we had to work or the PTSD that we had or whatever. I am so pumped that you are saying this right mm -hmm. now. And also I would love for you to show me this research Yes, <laughs> because I'm so curious about this. We, he was like, are you sure that's, I'm like, it must be a thing. It must be a thing that for instance, why do some families or the genetics in some family, you could eat certain foods and it, you would have no inflammation or you wouldn't hold on to excess water weight. And then in other families, that's not the case. It must be because of how those genetics had to evolve over time to handle whatever was happening in that part of the world or, right? Well, I'm sorry, I just geeked out yeah, so hard with I you. love that. <laughs> I love that so much. And, and it's a combination of the two, right? Like it's the stress factors, right? Combined with the fact that there were either choices or things that happened to that family that made it so that their biology was, you know, coinciding with the meals that they had, right? So, for example, you know, someone may have undergone like a famine. And in addition to that, they were in economic circumstances that were pretty dire for a number of decades, which also meant that once they were able to get themselves out of that economic crisis, all they could afford was living in a food desert area, right? Like, And so like the food choices that they had weren't so great. In addition to that, you got to think about the fact that famine, economic depravity, and low financial resources are all reasons to be chronically stressed. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right, and so like it literally becomes like this almost kind of like downward spiral of health where the physical is feeding the mental and the mental is feeding the physical and it's just kind of spiraling down. And very often you see, you know, especially with the going back to the hormone cortisol, you see that an excess in cortisol definitely tends to situate itself in certain parts of the body. And so you know, for certain individuals, you may actually get like a lot of um, excess uh, weight in the in the belly area mm -hmm. that is more situated with not just what they're eating. Some people just look at someone who maybe has a, a heavier midsection and think just the food. They're not thinking also it's the stress factors. It's yes. the fact that they have actual hormones flooding through their bloodstream that's actually making their digestion, their metabolism, and the ways in which they're ingesting the world very different from the next person. And yes. so their body is actually morphing around that. Yeah, I mean, I hate to say this, but if listeners don't want to go to therapy for any other reason, it actually can affect how you feel physically, how you look physically, how you carry weight on your body. I know in my most stressful seasons, I literally look like I'm four months pregnant. Mm. Like it all shows up here and I carry it as water weight. And it took me forever to realize that because I was like, I, I didn't change anything. Mm -hmm. I'm eating the same foods. Why am I carrying all of this inflammation? And I would feel achy, like all of this stuff that you don't think, oh, if I sit with someone and I cry about it and I talk about my feelings and I learn some things that can help me navigate it, it doesn't just help you mentally, emotionally. It also really helps you physically. So if y'all are listening and you won't go to a therapist for any <laughs> other reason, like let that be the reason you go to the therapist, why you grab the book, why you do all the things. 
I'm before, I mean, cause we've been talking for so long and I want to talk to you forever cause this has been <laughs> incredible, but I am just really curious from a career perspective, how you got into this line of work is <laughs> very specific. Yeah. <laughs> I do get that a lot. And, um, you know, I, I like to say that this work kind of found me because I wasn't, this is actually my second career. Mm. Yeah. I actually used to work in advertising in New York for five years. Whoa. Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. So it was a completely different lifestyle. And, you know, I actually started volunteering in my hometown and the volunteer work started looking more and more like mental health centered volunteer work. And I actually attended my first therapy session um, around that time. And the therapist told me, like, you'd make a great therapist. You should consider it. And that kind of just took me down down this path. But the intergenerational piece, that just kept showing up in my work. Like, everyone kept coming in with the same stuff. And I just kept saying, like, why is it that we're not naming the fact that this person was in a relationship that was highly toxic with a ton of domestic disputes that really drained her and that her mother suffered the same fate and that her grandmother did too. And that all these people are coming in with these similar histories and we're not like calling it Mm. because calling it would be only the first step to actually helping people heal. And in therapy, unfortunately, none of us are trained around this, which is such a disservice to the therapeutic world and to the people that we serve. Because we're, we're not actually addressing something that is so prominent and that so many of us need help with. So I decided I'm, I'm just going to write it. I'm going to write the so book. That's cool. So what does your work look like today? Is it working one-on-one with patients? Is it research? Is it you know sharing information like in the book or the work that you do on social? Yeah, so right now I've actually transitioned to just the book because the book had been so demanding that I couldn't keep up with the book's demands, and then also just being very present to clients. Yeah, because it's not fair to to be half present with regards to therapy, period, but especially trauma. I'm hoping to also start training folks um, in the area of generational healing so that they can do the work with clients and, and we can have better service out there that really centralizes the types of tools that people need. Gosh, it's so crazy when you hear about something that's so prevalent in society but is not taught and I'm really passionate about the subject of women's hormones Mm -hmm. and perimenopause and menopause because I've experienced a lot of um, hormone imbalance over the last couple years and I've Mm -hmm. had to work really hard and every doctor I talk to everybody they're like you get I don't know an hour of training on women's hormones in medical school but we're half the population. So it's just this crazy that there's this old saying that like in science, you sort of need the old guard to die out before a new thing is adopted. And I love that there are people who are leading these conversations and sharing this wisdom. If the audience is listening and they're like, Oh my gosh, we need all the things like tell us everything. Where can they find beyond the book, which everyone's going to go buy, uh, where can they find more of you, more mm-hmm. of your insights, like learn more from you or get trained by you? Maybe like what tells all the details? Yes. So I am actually um, Dr. Marielle Bouquet com is my website. And then um, I'm mostly on LinkedIn these days, but on LinkedIn, it's just my name, Dr. Marielle Bouquet. And I am hoping to establish perhaps it's going to be like primarily in the New York area for at least the first cohort or group that I'm going to be training because that's um, my local area. But then I'm going to extend it because I know that we need the training. Um, We need it now because we're all, you know, in a place where we we could use it. So um, I will announce it probably on LinkedIn at at some point, maybe in late 2024, um, when I'm going to start opening up some training so that we can all have like a collaborative space where we can talk about these things cool very Mm -hmm. cool Mm -hmm. this has been incredible and i i cannot wait to hear the audience response because i know they're gonna dig it so Uh. thank you for taking the time (laughs) this was awesome thank you so much for having me